My name is Poe, Edgar Allan Poe. I write stories. Charges have been brought against me by certain ignoramuses that I have never written a tale with a moral. By way of mitigating these ridiculous accusations, I offer the following unusual history, a history about whose moral there can be no question whatsoever. For you can see the moral in its very title, Never Bet the Devil Your Head. And note, please, that I do not bring in the lesson at the tag end of the fable as uh, others are wont to do. Very well. Here, then, I denounce my critics and beg no favor other than your close attention. From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. The world too long thought of Edgar Allan Poe as a door misogynist who concerned himself with black cats, gold bugs, pits, pendulums, and murder. Few realize, and fewer would believe, that this man of gloom had a sense of humor. This, the workshop now seeks to prove, in William N. Robeson's production of Edgar Allan Poe's satiric story, Never Bet the Devil Your Head, starring John Daner, with music conducted by Amerigo Marino, and with Jack Johnstone as guest director. It is not my design to vituperate my deceased friend, Toby Dammit. He was a sad dog, it is true, and a dog's death it was that he died. But he himself was not to blame for his vices. They grew out of a personal defect in his mother. I recall a conversation I had with her when Toby was a mere babe in arms. Duties to a well-regulated mind, Mr. Poe, are always pleasures. It is my duty, and therefore my pleasure, to see that as quickly as possible my son learns the difference between right and wrong. <coughs> but must you flog him so, Mrs. Dammit? Babies like tough steaks are invariably the better for beating. <coughs> it drives the evil propensities out. But my dear woman, my dear woman, you have the misfortune to be left-handed. I do not consider left-handedness a misfortune. No, you failed to, to understand me. Madam, a child flogged left-handedly had better be left unflogged. And deign to tell me why? The world revolves from right to left. If each blow in the proper direction drives out an evil propensity, it follows that every thump in an opposite one knocks its quota of wickedness in. Ha! That is a specious argument that does not warrant a reply, except perhaps this. <laughs> I was all too often present at Toby's chastisements, and even by the way he kicked, I could perceive that he was getting worse and worse every day. At last I saw, through tears in my eyes, that there was no hope for the villain at all, and one day when he had been cuffed until he grew black in the face, that no effect had been produced beyond that of making him wriggle himself into a fit, I could stand it no longer, but went down on my knees forthwith, and uplifting my voice made a prophecy. A prophecy of his ruin. For the fact is that his precocity in vice was awful. At five months of age, he got into such passions that he was unable to articulate. At six months, I caught him gnawing at a pack of playing cards. At seven months, he was in the constant habit of catching and kissing female babies. <laughs> At eight months, he peremptorily refused to put his signature to the temperance pledge. No, no, no. Thus he went on increasing in iniquity month after month, year after year, until in his youth. Mama, it is my desire to wear mustaches. And furthermore, I'll bet I can grow them. By the bill, book and candle, by Job's comforter, I'll bet I can. <laughs> As you see, he had even contracted a propensity for cursing and swearing and for backing his assertions with bets. Not that he actually laid wagers. No, I will do my friend the justice to say that he would as soon have laid eggs. With him, the thing was a mere formula, nothing more. You see, he was detestably poor. Another vice which the physical deficiency in his mother had entailed upon him. And this was the reason, no doubt, that his expletive expressions about betting seldom took a pecuniary turn. 
It was usually, I'll bet you what you please, or I'll, I'll, I'll bet you what you dare, or I'll bet you a trifle, or else, more significantly still, I'll bet the devil my head. At all events, through this most ungentlemanly practice, the ruin which I predicted for Toby Dammit overtook him at last. For indeed, the fashion had grown with his growth and strengthened with his strength, to the point that when he finally came to be a man, he could hardly utter a sentence without interlarding it with a, a proposition to gamble. Devil me, Mr. Poe. It is and remains my contention that these United States shall serve as an arrow to the target of liberty. Uh, my wager on that, sir. I'll bet you what you please. Toby, Toby, this habit of yours is an immoral one, and I feel constrained to tell you so. Pish posh, Mr. Poe. It is vulgar. I beg you to believe me. Twaddle. It is discountenanced by society. I say nothing but the truth. Tush. Gambling has been forbidden by an act of Congress. <laughs> I entreat you. I implore you. Utter foolishness. Then, by heaven, I shall have to knock some sense into you. <laughs> that, sir, was a, was a dastardly thing to do. Should you venture to try such an experiment again, I shall necessarily return in kind, and you will rue the result. I'll bet the devil my head you will. Yes, there it was again. The quintessence of his abominable expressions. I'll bet the devil my head. But there was nothing more I could do. I quit the scene in desperation and in sorrow. However, I could not evade the fact that Mr. Toby Dammit's soul was in a perilous state. I resolved to bring all my eloquence into play to save it. I vowed to serve him as St. Patrick. In the Irish Chronicle is said to have served the toad. That is to say... Awaken him to a sense of his situation. So, I addressed myself to the task. I remonstrated with him, but to no purpose. I demonstrated in vain. I entreated. He smiled. I implored. He laughed. I preached. He sneered. I threatened. He swore. I pulled his nose. He blew it. And once again... Uh, I'll bet the devil my head that taught you a lesson. Toby, have you considered the gross impropriety of a man betting his brains like banknotes? Uh, uh, should you have I? adopted this mode of wager, I'll bet the devil my head with a pertinacity and exclusiveness of devotion that displeases me no less than it surprises me. Now, the truth is... I'll bet the devil my head I'm going to get another lecture from you. The truth is, there is something in the air with which you are wont to give utterance to this offensive expression, something in your manner of enunciation which, for want of a more definite term, I must be permitted to call queer. Oh? It is your soul I am considering, Toby. Otherwise, you must believe this. I would not be speaking to you of these matters when I am so aware of your distaste for them. For some moments, he remained silent, merely looking me inquisitively in the face, but... Presently, he threw his head to one side and elevated his eyebrows to a great extent. Then he spread out the palms of his hands and shrugged up his shoulders. Then he winked with the right eye. He repeated the operation with the left. Then he shut them both up very tight. Then he opened them both so very wide that I became seriously alarmed for the consequences. And applying his thumb to his nose, he made a disgusting, indescribable movement with the rest of his fingers. Finally, setting his arms akimbo, he condescended to reply. Mr. Poe, I will be obliged to you if you would hold your tongue. I wish none of your advice. I despise your insinuations, equivocations, adumbrations. In short, sir, your entire peroration. I am of sufficient age to take care of myself. Or is it your misconception to consider me still an infant? Sir, do you mean to impugn my character? Is it your intention to insult me? Are you a fool, sir? Tell me, is your maternal parent aware of your absence from the domiciliary residence? I beg you. I put this question to you as a man of veracity, and I will bind myself to abide by your reply. I demand once more, does your mother know you're out? <laughs> your confusion betrays you. I'll bet the devil my head she does not. And so I bid you, Mr. Poe, good day. 
He left my presence in quite undignified haste. It were well for him that he did so. My anger had been aroused. For once, I would have taken him up on his insulting wager, bet the devil my head indeed. And I would have won for Satan, Mr. Dammit's little head, because, you see, the fact is my whereabouts was known by my mother. Ah, well, it was in the pursuance of my duty that I had been insulted, so I bore the insult like a man. And it now seemed to me that I had done all that could be required of me in the case of this miserable individual. I resolved to trouble him no longer with my counsel, but to leave him to his conscience and himself. But I must confess that although I forbore to intrude with my advice, I could not quite bring myself to give up his society altogether. Worse, I even went so far as to humor some of his less reprehensible propensities, and there were times when I found myself lauding his wicked jokes, uh, but with tears in my eyes, so profoundly did it grieve me to hear his evil talk. <laughs> oh, by the great horn toad, Mr. Poe, your aptitude for companionship, without censure or reprimand, has taken a turn for the better. It puts me in mind of the gentleman from New York, Mr. Greeley, who importuned a man of tender years to seek the western shores, remember? Yet, to my knowledge, he never made the trek himself. <laughs> oh, yes. Unsought advice is like a woman left waiting at the church. Uncalled for. Uh, well, perhaps. Uh, Zounds and hellions, sir. I'll bet the devil my head if you cannot agree on that. Well, all right, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> Toby, 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 what's to become of you? Oh, your concern is, uh, you know, touching, Mr. Paul. But it smacks of your former attitude, and I shall have none of it. None, I say. Come, it's too fine a day to spend it on peradventure and mayhap pursuits. Let us stroll the roadside in the country lane, commune with nature in her pristine glory, seek the unfettered pleasures of the here and the now. Well, sir? Very well, Toby. Thus it was that we strolled out together, arm in arm, our route leading us in the direction of a river. Ah, there, Mr. Poe. You see, beyond the stream, that field of fluorescence. Would not the Roman goddess herself exclaim over its perfection? Hmm. It is beautiful. Beautiful? <laughs> By the sons of Saul, your words make a beggary of faultless grandeur. My friend, your jaundiced eye requires closer appraisal, and your stopped-up nose a clearer width. But it's only a field of trees and flowers. I can see it very well from here. Stuff and nonsense. If you possessed a wit of perspicacity, that same jaundiced eye would indicate a covered bridge within a stone's throw. We shall cross it, go beyond it, and wander lonely as a cloud. Uh, to steal a phrase from one of the English greats. Come now. <laughs> The bridge was roofed over by way of protection from the weather, and the archway, having but few windows, was thus uncomfortably dark and echoed resoundingly. As we entered the passage, the contrast between the external glare and the interior gloom struck heavily upon my spirits. Not so upon those of the happy Dammit, who offered to bet the devil his head that I was hipped. <laughs> he seemed to be in unusual good humor. He was excessively lively, so much so that I entertained I know not what of uneasy suspicion. A certain species of austere Merry Andrewism seemed to beset my friend and caused him to make quite a tom fool of himself. Up here! On the railing! I'm a bird! I fly! Whee! Nothing would serve him but wriggling and skipping about under and over everything that came in his way, now shouting out and now lisping out all manner of odd little and big words. I really could not make up my mind whether to kick him or to pity him. And the Luvian Transcendentalism! At length, having passed nearly across the bridge, we approached the termination of the footway when our progress was impeded by a turnstile of some height. Through this, I made my way quietly, but this turn would not serve the turn of Mr. Dammit. Hold. Uh, this, 
this mechanism, Mr. Poe. <laughs> Are we cattle to be impeded in this manner? It's merely a turnstile. I pass through it without it's any... It's merely a turnstile. While me, I defy it. <laughs> How can you defy an inanimate object? By leaping over it. Uh, not only shall I leap over it, but I shall perform a buck and wing at the apex of my jump. Oh, but Toby, it's nearly five feet in height. <laughs> a bagatelle. Oh, you're a braggadocio. You cannot do it, and you know you can't. No? I'll bet the devil my head I can. You hear me? I'll bet the devil my head. I was about to reply, notwithstanding my previous resolution, with some remonstrance against his impiety, when suddenly I heard, close at my elbow, a slight cough, <laughs> which sounded very much like the ejaculation... A hem. I started and looked about me in surprise. My glance at length fell into a nook in the framework of the bridge, and there upon the figure of a little old gentleman of, shall we say, venerable aspect, yes, and of reverend appearance, for he not only had on a full suit of black, but his shirt was perfectly clean, and the collar turned very neatly down over a white cravat, while his hair was parted in front like a girl's. His hands were clasped pensively together over his stomach, and his two eyes were carefully rolled up into the top of his head. Upon observing him more closely, I perceived that he wore a black silk apron over his small clothes, and this was a thing which I thought very odd. Before I had time to make any remark, however, upon so singular a circumstance, he interrupted me. To this second observation, I was not immediately prepared to reply. The fact is, remarks of this laconic nature are nearly unanswerable. I am not ashamed to say, therefore, that I turned to Mr. Toby Dammit for assistance. Damn it! what are you about? Don't you hear? The gentleman says, ahem. I looked sternly at my friend while I thus addressed him, for, to say the truth, I felt particularly puzzled. And when a man is particularly puzzled, he must knit his brows and look savage, else he looks like a fool. Toby, damn it! Uh, although this sounded very much like an oath, believe me, nothing was further from my thoughts. Damn it! The gentleman says, ahem. I do not attempt to defend my remark on the score of profundity. I did not think it profound myself, but I have noticed that the effect of our speeches is not always proportionate to their importance in our own eyes. But if I had knocked Toby on the head with the turnstile itself, he could hardly have been more discomfited than when I addressed him with those simple words. You don't say so. Are you quite sure he said that? Well, at all events, I'm for it now, and may as well put a bold face upon the matter. Here goes then. Ahem! 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 Strangely, the little old gentleman seemed pleased. God only knows why. He left his station at the nook of the bridge, came forward with a gracious air, took Dammit by the hand, and shook it cordially, looking all the while straight up in his face with an air of the most unadulterated benignity it is possible for the mind of man to imagine. Finally, he spoke. Well, well, Toby Dammit. Ah, uh, that's right, good sir. And what think you of my assertion and my wager? That you can leap the turnstile? Correct you are, and perform with consummate skill a buck and wing at the apex of my leap. I am quite sure you will win your wager, damn it. but we are obliged to have a trial, you know. For the sake of mere form. Ahem. <clears throat> a, a trial, you say? <clears throat> My friend took off his coat with a deep sigh and tied a pocket handkerchief around his waist. He produced an unaccountable alteration in his countenance by twisting up his eyes and bringing down the corners of his mouth. <clears throat> I did not express myself aloud, but I thought this is a quite a remarkable silence on the part of Toby, damn it and is no doubt a consequence of his verbosity upon a previous occasion. I wonder if he has forgotten the many unanswerable questions which he propounded to me so fluently on the day when I gave him my last lecture. Ah, uh, him! The old gentleman now took him by the arm and led him more into the shade of the bridge, a few paces back from the turnstile. My good fellow, I make it a point of conscience to allow you this much run. Wait here till I take my place by the stile so that I may see whether you go over it handsomely 
and don't omit any flourishes of the buck and wing. A mere form, you know. I will say, one, two, three, and away! And mind you start at the word away. The little gentleman stood there a moment, looking quietly at Toby as though appraising him. Then he turned, walked away, and took his position by the stile. Again he paused a moment as if in profound reflection, then looked up and smiled very slightly, tightened the strings of his apron, and took a long, long look at Dammit. I thought to myself, what right has the old gentleman to make any other gentleman jump? Who is he? If he asks me to jump, I won't do it, and that's flat, and I don't care who the devil he is. The devil he... But what I said, or what I thought, or what I heard, occupied only an instant. The black-suited little man gave the word as agreed upon. One, two, three, and away! I saw Toby run nimbly and spring grandly from the floor of the bridge, cutting the most awful flourishes with his legs as he went up. I saw him high in the air, buck and winging it to admiration. I thought it a singular thing that he did not continue to go over, but the whole leap was the affair of a moment. And before I had a chance to make any profound reflection, down came Mr. Dammit on the flat of his back, on the same side of the stile from which he had started. At the same instant, I saw the old gentleman running off at the top of his speed. But ere leaving us, he had caught and wrapped up in his apron something that fell heavily into it from the darkness of the arch just over the turnstile. At all this, I was much astonished, but I had no leisure to think, for Mr. Dammit lay particularly still, and I concluded that his feelings had been hurt and that he stood in need of my assistance. I hurried up to him and found that he had received what might be termed a serious injury. Quite serious. Quickly, I threw open an adjacent window of the bridge and the sad truth flashed upon me. About five feet above the top of the turnstile, there extended a flat iron bar that served to strengthen the structure. With the edge of this brace, it appeared evident, the neck of my unfortunate friend had come precisely in contact and alas, the truth is, he had been deprived of his head. He did not long survive his terrible loss. Despite the efforts of the physicians, he grew worse and, at length, died. So I bedewed his grave with my tears, worked a bar sinister on his family escutcheon, and assumed the general expenses of his modest funeral. Exit Toby Dammit. Toby Dammit, a lesson to all riotous livers, and proof absolute of my initial assertion that every tale should have, must have, does have a moral. <laughs> You have just heard John Daner in the CBS Radio Workshop's production of Never Bet the Devil Your Head, under the guest direction of Jack Johnstone. It was adapted for radio by Alan Botzer, with music composed and conducted by Amerigo Marino. Heard in the supporting cast were Eleanor Audley, Leon Ledoux, Dawes Butler, Richard Beals, and Howard McNear. Next week, from New York, the workshop will present The Heart of Man, a dramatization of a surgical operation in which the heart itself is the principal actor. Hugh Douglas speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.